Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. We're now in the centenary year of the end of the First World War, um, which was a conflict that left three quarters of a million British men dead and over one and a half million wounded. The war had begun, as we know, in 1914, and at that stage, the country was actually quite used to war, having been fighting in the Boer Wars at the turn of that century, the Anglo-Afghan War just before, and the Boxer Rebellion in China within the previous 30 years. And this was a complete change from the situation at the start of the Crimean War 60 years earlier, when that conflict followed some 40 years of peace. From previous experience, we knew that in wartime, deaths from disease had always exceeded deaths as a direct result of combat. And one civilian who sounded a note of caution was Sir William Osler, who was Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford. At 65 years old, he was perhaps only too well aware of the burden of preventable disease in these earlier conflicts. But at this early stage, the health threats which were to come over the next four years were still unknown. But nonetheless, his words were to, were to prove prophetic, and we'll return to him later on. His words, in fact, only echoed those of the Times war correspondent 60 years earlier, at the start of the Crimean War. We knew that war was bad for health. What we didn't perhaps know at the start of the Crimean War was exactly why or what we could perhaps do about it. But the title of this talk is Military Public Health in Wartime. And uh, I'd like to just pause for a moment to look at what public health actually means um, for people who don't have a medical background or even with a medical background don't have a public health background. And when I say I'm a public health physician, people usually uh, equate that with um, looking down drains and looking at sewers uh, and chasing rats. And of course, um, although that is part of what in the military we've called military preventive medicine, which encompasses public health, occupational health, uh, and environmental health, um, public health is much more about protecting the health of populations um, and monitoring the health of populations, educating people on how to protect their own health. And this definition, um, which was adopted by the World Health Organization, crafted by uh, former Chief Medical Officer Sir Donald Aitchison, is particularly important when we look at it in a military and a wartime context. It's about preventing disease, but it's also about the organized efforts of in a military context, the whole of the armed forces. So I just want to spend um, a minute looking at communicable disease in military history. And as we mentioned, although uh, as well as deaths in war, exceeding deaths from conflict, um, disease is a greater, exerts a greater toll on health than war injury. And the very circumstances of war provide a fertile ground for communicable disease, which we'll look at in more detail shortly. But historically, the important diseases have been the gastrointestinal diseases, dysentery, cholera, typhoid, um, or the vector-borne diseases, um, such as typhus. The venereal diseases have been important as well, and we don't have time to go into that um, this afternoon. But during the 19th century, approximately half of all admissions to military hospitals in wartime were for venereal disease. And prior to the uh, introduction of vaccination in the late 19th century, smallpox as well took its toll. So let's look now at the Crimean War, which um, started in 1854 and went on for about two years. And it was a war that brought a lot of problems. Um, there were very long, fragile supply lines. Um, long before we had air transport, the only way of resupplying the troops in the field was by sea, um, which meant a very long journey 
um, from the UK through the Mediterranean and then across the Black Sea. The conditions were horrendous and we're fortunate in that we have a photographic legacy. This is the first war in which there were war photographers, people like Roger Fenton. And we can see just what the conditions were like. And we can see here um, a group of soldiers sitting on the ground outside some very meagre accommodation with their only transport, a horse. Um, you can see that they're largely unshaven. That's partly the fashion of the day, but probably also necessity. A lot of them are smoking, and that is another story. Um, but also, there's a woman there. And many women did accompany their husbands to the battlefield, where um, they worked as cooks or laundresses or nurses. And there are some horrendous stories of um, women who'd accompanied their husbands giving birth in ditches, um, in snowstorms. Um, and we don't hear very much about the debt that they paid. There was also that military skill fade. As I mentioned, um, we hadn't been to war for about 40 years. Um, the Peninsula War had been the last major conflict, um, and two generations of soldiers had passed through the military from then. Um, so people had forgotten how to fight a conflict, how to cope with austere conditions. Military medical management was not a great success in the Crimean War. And this is um, often laid at the door of the Director of Medical Services, Sir uh, Andrew Smith, who, if you look at Wikipedia, is shown as a zoologist. Hmm, well, this is one of the illustrations for which he's best remembered. He joined the Army Medical Service in 1916, and he was a graduate of this university here in Edinburgh. He, he got his MD here in, in 1819. And he spent much of his early career um, on military service as a doctor in Africa. But clearly he wasn't terribly busy because um, he developed interest in ethnology, geology, and zoology. And um, in 1836, he, he met up with Darwin on his second Beagle voyage. When in 1837 he returned to England, um, his military career was progressing remarkably well, um, and he was in the process of publishing the five volumes of his book. But in fact, this was not a medical book. Um, this was the book from which you see an illustration here. Um, during this time, Sir James McGregor was director of medical services, and he'd been Wellington's medical officer in the Peninsula War, a very high achiever, uh, and in fact, he, he served as Director General for a remarkable 36 years, um, retiring at the age of 81, as the books put it, full of years and honours. Um, and he retired in 1853, just the year before the outbreak of the Crimean War, and Smith was selected to replace him. Unfortunately, of course, the outbreak of war found the Army Medical Services ill-prepared for conflict, and Smith was widely criticised for his management, although the subsequent Royal Commission uh, of Inquiry exonerated him. Um, but there's no doubt that medical preparation perhaps uh, contributed to some of the problems. And what were those problems? Well, firstly, little understanding of the principles of hygiene. You went out to fight a war, you fought a war, you didn't worry about these strange medical ideas. And during that conflict, 22,000 British soldiers lost their lives. Now, when you put that in the context of the number of soldiers who lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan, which is measured in the hundreds, even for a, a conflict that went on for as many years as that did, um, the death of 22,000 in just two years is fairly horrific. But when you break it down in detail, something like 16,000 of those were due to disease which was potentially preventable. Something had to be done. And at this point, I want to introduce this gentleman, Edmund Alexander Parks. He was the son of a Midlands woolen merchant, and after his father's business failed, he was sent um, to London to live with his uncle, 
uh, and his uncle put him through medical school where he proved to be an extremely bright student indeed. And having graduated, um, he joined the army and he went out to India and Burma um, and that provided him with the material um, to write his MD thesis. He served in the army for three years uh, and then he returned to his alma mater, um, University College Hospital, where he, uh, by the age of 30, had become a uh, consultant, uh, consultant physician. Um, and he no doubt drew on his military experience in his um, clinical practice, and he became very widely known. So when the Crimean War broke out, the government sent for Parks, and they asked him to go and set up a civilian hospital. Initially, the idea was to set it up um, on the Bosphorus, uh, near Scutari, but he went out and he wrecked the site um, along with the engineer who was allocated to him, um, one uh, John Brunton. And they couldn't find a suitable site, so eventually they decided on a site on the Dardanelles at a place called Renkiai. And there they set up the hospital, which was designed by none other than Brunel. Um, and it was the world's first prefabricated hospital. And it was all sent out by ship and erected extremely quickly. Um, Brunton, in fact, was um, a railway engineer who had worked for Brunel. And here's a picture of the hospital. Um, and you can see it's situated um, close to the water, which had the advantage that there were two piers where ships could dock to unload the casualties who were brought from the battlefield. And it was something like a two-day journey by sea, even for the fastest steamships. Um, uh, and the hospital was made up of separate huts, which was um, a great advantage in preventing cross-infection. Um, they were well ventilated, they incorporated the best in hospital design. Um, and Brunton and Brunel clearly got on very well with Parks, and here is Brunel's uh, letter to Brunton recommending Parks, and saying that he's exactly the man that I should have selected an enthusiastic, clever, agreeable man, devoted to the object, understanding the plans and works, and quite disposed to attach as much importance to the perfection of the building and all those parts I deem most important as to mere doctoring. The hospital was um, a great success, albeit it perhaps didn't receive as many casualties um, as they'd been expecting because of the location, and the mortality rate was only of the order of about 3%, which at that time was quite amazing. Parks, though, um, was very concerned about the number of deaths from disease that he'd, he'd heard about. Um, he was um, close friends with Florence Nightingale, and in fact one of Nightingale's nurses was Parks' own sister, um, Maria Parks, um, and she worked at the Renkio Hospital. So he was only too well aware of what was going on at Scutari. And he resolved that something had to be done about it. So he and Nightingale, on their return at the end of the Crimean War, lobbied the Secretary of State for war um, to hold a, a board of inquiry, which they did. And the Sanitary Commission met um, in 1857. Um, and at the end of their deliberations, they produced a report. And one of their recommendations was that an army medical school should be set up um, to train doctors entering the army in military medicine and how to look after the troops under their, um, their management, which was something that had never been done before. So the army medical school was duly set up at Fort Pitt in Chatham, and the building still exists to this day. It's a girls' school now. Um, and there were four professors um, appointed, of whom one was Parks, and he was appointed the professor of military hygiene. Um, and he was developing theories of hygiene to teach to um, his student medical officers. And he had no textbook to help him, so he set out to write one. And his book, A Manual of Practical Hygiene, was published four years after the Army Medical School was opened, and it became a bestseller. It was translated into many languages, including Japanese, 
It ran to a total of eight editions, um, latterly under the editorship of others, um, and its last edition was published as late as 1941. And the majority of the lessons in that book are still valid today. He talks about um, clean water, safe food, good nutrition, um, taking exercise, avoiding obesity, all the things that we would recognize today. And the only gap is the whole of the science of bacteriology, which was still um, in the future at the time when Parks was writing this. So, with this new teaching of what was to become public health to new medical officers, how much of an improvement was there? Well, Parks unfortunately died in his 59th year um, in 1876. Um, Paradoxically and ironically, he died of TB, which he probably contracted during his time at Renkioi. Um, he'd not enjoyed good health throughout the latter years of his life. So, 1899, off we go to war again, this time in South Africa, with the best part of half, or oh, in, in excess of half a million soldiers. Um, and nearly half a million admissions to hospital. This is not to say that every soldier, of course, went into hospital um, during the conflict because there were some uh, repeated admissions, but very, very high hospitalization rate, um, of which only 27,000 were due to enemy action, so not much has changed there. Oops. And nearly 10% of the soldiers were victims of typhoid, of which, of which over 10% died, more than died of their wounds, so something had to be done. Well, in 1898, the Royal Army Medical Corps had come into being um, from an amalgamation of its predecessor organizations, the Army Hospital Corps uh, and the Army Staff Corps. Um, and its role was gradually strengthening. And in the aftermath of the war, there was a recognition of the distinction between hygiene and sanitation. And sanitation, actually, as the most important role of military medicine. So the difference is that hygiene is the basic science. It was what Parks was teaching, and he was teaching it to medical officers. Sanitation is the art of putting it all into practice. And that is something that everybody does. If we go back to that definition of public health from the World Health Organization and from Aitchison, um, this is about the organized efforts of society, military society perhaps, um, and the art of the possible. So how did they go about this? Well, first of all, they appointed some military sanitation specialists. Major David Bruce, who was later to become um, well known um, for his work in identifying brucellosis or Malta fever, um, which bears his name, and then Major Horrocks, who we'll talk about shortly. And they actually established an army school of sanitation. Um, they set up under the Royal Army Medical Corps, sanitary companies, which were um, moving the whole art of sanitation away from just doctors to the wider army. And they set up um, local sanitary officers, recognizing that it wasn't enough just to have regulations, but you had to actually police it. You had to make sure that people were following the regulations. So the sanitary companies consisted of an officer in 25 other ranks, um, initially, each sanitary company had a doctor, but then they realized that this was not just um, something that doctors could do. Um, and by the end of World War I, there were 66 sanitary companies. Um, and by 1918, there were 17,000 people working in military preventive medicine, which is a tremendous achievement. So why is the military environment so hazardous to health? Why do communicable diseases spread so rapidly? Well, first of all, population mixing. Whenever you get a group of people coming together from very different backgrounds, they tend not to have immunity to the microbes that we all have in our own environment and that we become used to. Um, and you see this even today when people go on a cruise ship and a few days into the cruise, there's an outbreak of norovirus or there's an outbreak of flu or um, 
other respiratory infection. You see the same thing when a group of children start school at the same time, um, or when a group of students start university together. You'll get outbreaks of infection. Um, so you've got that population mixing from recruitment, from conscription that brings people in from the wider population, and also from interacting with the host nation and interacting with detainees, prisoners of war, for example. And then you've got people who normally live in family groups or even live on their own who are sharing accommodation and sharing catering. You've got people who are under stress, and stress increases the risk of infection because it lowers your immune response. Um, so people who are uh, under stress of attack or bombing. Um, traveling is also stressful, and again, that increases your, your risk of infection. And then there are those necessary occupational risks which go with being um, in the armed forces and fighting a war. For example, um, this fairly well-known picture, um, and for anybody of a squeamish disposition, I would reassure you that there's nobody dead in this. These are um, the ones who aren't standing up or asleep. Um, but you can see that the conditions are horrific, and there are all sorts of challenges in maintaining health if you've got to live under those conditions for weeks on end. There's also the host infrastructure, the, the country at war that you're in. There's the disruption to the infrastructure, water, food, sanitation, movement of populations, so you've probably increased the number of people in an area, um, and you're overstretching the local resources. So you've, you've got focal overcrowding as you bring people in, you're billeting people in temporary accommodation, and the potential for spread from, of disease from the civilian to the military population, or indeed vice versa, uh, as has happened on numerous occasions. And you know, just, just to look at um, one example, this is from Verdun in 1916, um, of the sort of devastation that can happen, and you know, water supplies, sewage supplies, refuse disposal, all gets horrendously disrupted, and you know, there not much has changed. We can see similar pictures today in Syria and other countries at war. So today, military forces keep themselves healthy or try to the best of their ability to keep healthy through something known as force health protection, which expands all the definitions that we've been looking at that have developed over the years uh, and encapsulates it. That you're trying to preserve the fighting potential of a force because a commander can't fight a, a war successfully without human resources. And those human resources are basically soldiers and they've got to be healthy soldiers. Um, and it encapsulates taking actions to counter the debilitating effects of environment, disease, and weapons through preventive measures for personnel systems and operational f formation. So at all levels, an individual level, groups, and the whole army, the whole of the armed forces, has to buy into maintaining health. Otherwise, it ain't going to work. So the priorities for military health uh, are very much the same sort of priorities um, that we um, use in public health today. Safe water, food hygiene, sanitation, communicable disease control by whatever means available to us, and in wartime, recognizing the importance of animals, and particularly in the First World War, um, when you had very large numbers of people, um, vehicles were very much in their infancy, and very, very large number of horses, something like half a million horses on the Western Front. New aspects of military health, which were just beginning to come in um, at the start of the First World War, the whole understanding of the mechanisms of disease transmission, the whole science of bacteriology and microbiology, um, immunization and protecting people by vaccination was just coming in. Smallpox vaccination was well established, but others we'll talk about in a few minutes in a bit more detail. The Royal Army Medical College um, took over from um, its predecessor, Army Medical School, in 1907, and it was all becoming very much more organized. And there were new manuals, new textbooks, and um, Colonel Firth had written the Manual of Military Hygiene, Military Sanitation for soldiers. This is not about writing textbooks for doctors. This is about getting it right down to grassroots level. So early in World War I, we had the threats of population mixing, respiratory illness, and meningitis. Meningitis, that's an odd one. Well, 
all of you with children who've been to university, grandchildren who've been to university, will know that today um, students are immunized against meningococcal meningitis. Um, and in fact, young children, young babies are immunized against it as well now. Because again, when you put people together, this is one of the infections that can spread very quickly. The microorganism that causes it lives in the nasopharynx, the back of the nose and throat. Um, and even the disease-causing strain can live as a normal commensal at the back of the nose and throat in ordinary people. Um, and we don't know exactly why it is that some people can carry it harmlessly and in others it causes disease. But one thing that's certain is when you get people moving together, carriage rates go up and probably 10% of people carry it normally. That will go up in military training establishments to something like about 60%. And you're bound to hit a few susceptible people. So today we can immunize. But we can see this very dramatically. This graph shows um, the uh, incidence of meningococcal meningitis in the United States Army. And the circle shows what happened in the First World War after the United States joined into the conflict. Uh, and again, there was another peak um, during the Second World War, slightly smaller. Um, but in the middle, you've got a peak in the civilian community um, during the recession as well. So it's, it's a disease which today is manageable, but um, in wartime uh, can have hugely problematic effects. But in trench warfare, which we saw for the first time on a large scale in the First World War, there are other challenges as well, the water, the mud, the rats, the food spoilage. Um, and some specific diseases, trench foot, trench fever, um, trench nephritis, a kidney disease, which nobody's ever quite worked out what it was, um, trench mouth, where people couldn't maintain their oral hygiene and got most horrendous mouth ulcers, and the threat of special weapon systems such as gas attacks, which came in a, a little later during the First World War. And we can see here some pictures of soldiers maintaining their kit. Now, they're not mending their vests. They're actually checking them for lice because lice spread typhus. And the only way to get rid of them was to physically remove them. And the Scottish soldiers suffered particularly badly because lice used to love hiding in the warm pleats of the kilt. We mustn't forget as well that the First World War was also a, a world war. There was a global dimension. So people were serving in um, conditions which were extraordinarily challenging. For example, in Gallipoli, um, where there were horrendous levels of gastrointestinal infection and parasitic diseases. And there were also foreign laborers who would come in to work with the armies, who, again, would bring in their own uh, diseases that um, the British troops had no resistance to. So there were a lot of personalities who um, were instrumental in raising the profile of health protection in wartime uh, during the First World War. And there's a few of them named here and some of the names we've mentioned already. Colonel Allport, for example, um, wrote his health memoranda for soldiers, a little pocket leaflet. Uh, Commanders will see that the ground allotted to them is kept scrupulously clean. Um, Pending the construction of latrines, temporary trenches must at once be prepared, prepared to prevent soil pollution. Men must be prevented from drinking water that's not pure. All very, very sensible stuff. And that was published and given out to all soldiers in 1914. So implementation of, of these new health policies was all about having the regulations in place, training everybody, giving the commanding officer responsible, responsibility, making sure he was responsible for the health of his troops, and then inspecting the medical officer carrying out inspections, the hygiene staff and the sanitary companies carrying out inspections to make sure everybody was kept on their toes. And in all probability, when you know, conditions were horrendous and you were living in a trench, keeping yourself, uh, keeping your trench tidy was probably not top of your priority list and s until somebody came along and really cracked the whip. Even Lord Kitchener bought into this. Advice to soldiers. Your duty cannot be done unless your health is sound. Yup, he was right. <laughs> 
And he also goes on about finding temptations in both wine and women and says rather courteously, you must entirely resist both temptations. And whilst treating all women with perfect courtesy, you should avoid any intimacy. Well, sexually transmitted infections are another story altogether, but um, we get the message about buying into health protection there. Top of that list of ways of protecting health was safe water. And it's worth spending a few minutes just looking at that. Every man in the field needs 10 gallons of water for drinking, for washing. Um, and every horse needs 10 gallons of water as well. And when you look at the fact that there were one and a half million men on the Western Front and half a million horses, that adds up to a lot of water. It also adds up to an awful lot of wastewater and horse urine to be disposed of. So it's perhaps easy to realize, um, leaving aside the geology of the area, which um, contributed to the uh, very muddy conditions of the trenches, uh, it's easy to realize that uh, unless you looked after the, the issues of water very carefully, you were going to be in trouble. So water was obtained from wells and boreholes. Um, but in order to supply that amount of water, they needed to extract over a thousand gallons of water an hour from each well. Now, the problem is that the geology is such that um, when you get down to the aquifers, you've actually got some very fine clay, and so the water is potentially very muddy, and you can only take it out at a certain rate. If you try to pump it harder than that, all you're going to do is suck up mud. Now, you've got to filter the water to get the mud out of it anyway and get the particles out. You've got to purify it, you've got to chlorinate it, and then you've got to take the taste out um, in order to make it palatable. And to do this was quite a challenge. Now, first of all, the engineers developed special airlift pumps which were able to extract a larger volume of water without actually disturbing the sediment too much. Uh, and so there wasn't too much sediment to, to filter out of it. But Horrocks comes along and devises a new water filter. Now, Horrocks was an incredible man. Um, he served in all sorts of really challenging places, um, but crucially for us, he was a member of the Army Sanitary Committee in 1914, and we'll meet him again later on in his role as chairman of the Anti-Gas Committee. Um, and he developed a water clarifier and sterilizer. Now, the traditional type of um, water filter, you pour the water into the filter and then it goes outwards. Horrocks reversed this. He devised a cylinder in which the filter was inside the cylinder, but you actually filtered the water into the central part and then you drew off the clean water from um, from the center of the cylinder. And I think you can probably see this um, if you look at the arrows on the diagram. And the advantage of this um, was that if the filter did become clogged, you could simply take it out and give it a good shake and the sediment falls off. And that would become clearer if you look at um, this picture of a dismantled uh, filter. And you can see here that you've got this filter sleeve which goes around the outside of this framework. Now, the water... Um, comes into the, the cylinder, which is actually part of this contraption, um, is filtered into the center of this cylinder, which is actually supported on the framework, um, uh, and then goes into this holding tank. So, as I say, if this becomes clogged, take it out, give it a good shake, and you, you're ready to go again, which was a huge development. Now, um, that's a, a fairly small man-portable water sterilization cart, you can have a bigger version, if you like, on a lorry. And having filtered your water and sterilized it, you need to make sure that it's sufficiently safe to use. So Horrocks then develops what became universally known as the Horrocks box, case water testing. Uh, and those were widely distributed so that, again, duties of the unit sanitary staff was to go around testing the water to make sure that it was safe to drink. So um, they were doing as much as possible to ensure um, that gastrointestinal disease from contaminated water was prevented. 
And then you're living in a trench for many weeks. Um, you have to keep your trench tidy, however muddy, however gruesome it is. And sanitary plans were developed for trenches, which separated areas which should be kept safe from areas which were um, handling more hazardous, hazardous materials, such as food, um, such as food waste, and such as toilet waste. So you have these areas such as the, foods, the, the food safe, the rat-proof food safe over here, uh, the firing bay, which you want to keep as clean as possible. The slightly hazardous areas, the refuse bags, well, uh, well um, kept off to one side. And then right at the back out of the way, you've got the latrines and the urinals. And again, this, this was a tremendous help in preventing disease in the trenches. Communicable disease control, though, specific um, control of diseases during the First World War. Well, we had smallpox vaccination, which had been around for a long time. Typhoid vaccination, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, tetanus vaccination was very much in its early days. The anti-tetanus serum had just been developed, um, and this, of course, was the horse serum. Um, but the tetanus toxoid that we, we all know uh, and have all received today was still very much in the future. Typhoid vaccination was developed by this gentleman, Sir Ron Roth, Roth Wright. His slightly unusual forename um, is derived from his Swedish mother, and I'm not quite sure that I've pronounced it correctly, but his students, um, I understand, uh, knew him as uh, almost right. He was not a popular man. Um, and he was the professor of pathology at Netley, and he developed the first typhoid vaccine as early as 1896. Um, but its introduction was controversial and initially it was considered to be ineffective. Um, he tested it on himself, he tested it on 15 soldiers, and then it was actually used in the Boer War on a relatively small number of soldiers. Um, but unfortunately, he was not a good statistician um, and he didn't develop um, a good evaluation strategy for his new vaccine. And so he was unable to prove that it had been effective and he was frankly castigated for it. Um, and as a result of that, um, it led to his resignation. And he was followed by uh, Sir William Leith Leishman, who became later Director General of the Army Medical Services. Um, who actually showed that it was extremely effective. Um, and 10 million doses of it were produced during the First World War and were distributed. Um, and the results were absolutely excellent. Um, there was, in 1915, there were 1,000 cases of typhoid amongst UK troops, um, compared with 69,000 in the French troops. So it was actually extremely effective. But um, Wright was not a popular man. Um, he was a vehement opponent of female suffrage on the grounds that women's brains were innately incapable of understanding political issues. Mm. Not politically correct, particularly in the centenary year of um, women's suffrage. But um, he found fame, in, uh, in, uh, although not fortune, um, in the future. Um, because he was immortalised in George Bernard Shaw's play, A Doctor's Dilemma, which is actually based on right. Tetanus immunisation, as I said, um, we had the passive immunisation um, in 1897, which was used um, both as a prophylactic vaccination, in other words, given preventively, um, and for treatment of potential cases of tetanus. Um, but it was 1924 before we actually saw um, the... Um, definitive tetanus toxide. So how much of a difference did it make? Well, in the Boer War, um, there were, as we saw earlier, 57,000 cases and uh, over 10% deaths. But of those soldiers who were vaccinated, there were only 2% who actually contracted um, typhoid. So it actually was effective. But in World War I, um, in total, there were only, amongst British troops, um, 7,500 cases with uh, just over 250 deaths out of a total strength 
of over a million people. So I think we can regard that as a huge success. Tetanus, on the other hand, the only real treatment, apart from that um, anti-tetanus serum, was surgical management of contaminated wounds to try and remove as much of the, um, the mud and the fragments of uniform that had been blown into the wounds uh, as possible. Um, and fortunately, with good surgical techniques which had been developed on the battlefield, um, there were not all that many cases when you consider how many people were wounded. Um, a million and a half people um, seriously wounded. Um, but it did still carry a very high mortality. Um, as regards gastrointestinal disease, which um, under austere conditions can be a major threat, um, that was a big success story. The principles of safe water and safe uh, food certainly did make an enormous difference and there was not the great outbreaks of gastrointestinal disease on the Western Front that we could easily have seen. I want to move on now to a most unpleasant threat to health and one which required a very agile response by the Army Medical Services during the First World War and that's the use of gas. The Second Battle of Ypres had begun on the 22nd of April 1915 and the Germans released unexpectedly 168 tonnes of chlorine gas over a six and a half kilometre length of the battlefield. Now, what does 168 tonnes of gas look like? Well, some people with long memories might well remember Avogadro's hypothesis when, when you did chemistry at school. Um, it is fairly heavy. It converts to a gas that would fill 40 Olympic swimming pools. But of course, chlorine spreads, um, and even at considerable dilution, it's actually quite disabling and can be lethal. So at 1,000 parts per million, it can be lethal almost immediately, and even 30 parts per million, and it will cause disabling, choking, blindness, stinging of the eyes. Um, and that 1,000 parts per million your 40 Olympic swimming pools will spread out to sufficient to fill 100 square kilometers to a depth of one meter. So you can see it spreads enormously. Um, it's a double-edged weapon though, and it only takes a slight change in the weather, and it can blow back to your own troops, um, or it can hang about in, in the valleys, um, in places you really, really don't want it. Um, but it was used against the Canadians, and then on the 5th of May, it was used against the British. It's, it's a greenish gas. Um, it, as you know, it's very strong smelling. And it forms an acid once it dissolves in moisture. So typically in the eyes or in the respiratory tract um, or in any moist, damp or sweaty skin. Highly irritant. And because it's a heavy gas, it sinks into hollows in the ground. And in trench warfare, it sinks into the trenches just where you don't want it, just where you've got your casualties lying on stretchers, you've got small animals, probably trench pets, um, and the rats. And if rats, if live rats running around are bad enough, believe me, you don't really want dead rats in your trench either. This trench map, or this, um, this map, in fact, of uh, a German gas attack in 1916, gives uh, an idea of how it can spread. And although it's probably not easy to see the colours on this slide, um, the black cross hatching is where the gas was strongly felt, the green was where it was slightly felt, um, and you find if you match that to a contour map and cross reference it, that you, uh, you'd find that it, it was sinking into the hollows in the ground. But also, the, the green dots are actually worth noting, and that's where cattle were killed. Uh, so there was a, a huge knock-on effect on the local agricultural community um, who were innocent victims in this war. This picture, I think, um, is probably very familiar to all of us, but I always think this one is, is rather more poignant. Troops in a trench, surrounded by this cloud of gas that they can't get away from, protected by the most meagre of gas masks, bits of cloth, um, and a medic in the background trying to help somebody who's already become a victim to the, to the gas. He's 
obviously hunched over. So those early gas masks worked on the principle of chlorine being absorbed by moist cloth. And in particular, it's, it can be inactivated by chemicals such as urea, which is found in human urine. So in those early days, before gas masks were issued, we have soldiers peeing on their socks and then holding them over their nose and mouth. Pretty unpleasant, but it was better than nothing. And the first gas masks were um, made from gauze or from cotton waste. And soldiers would use motoring goggles if they had them to try and protect their eyes. The Daily Mail, in the habit of the media, then jumped in on the act and decided to encourage um, ladies back home to make gas masks for soldiers. But unfortunately, due to um, an error, instead of saying, um, sew cotton waste into gauze and tie tapes on and send it out to the soldiers, they told them to sew cotton wool into gauze and send it out to the soldiers. Now, I don't know whether you've ever tried to breathe through cotton wool, but wet cotton wool, but unlike cotton waste, which is lumpy and you can breathe through it, cotton wool soaked in water actually is almost impervious to air. And sadly, there were fatalities as a result. People who tried to use these masks couldn't breathe in them, took them off, and then had to breathe the gas, the chlorine gas that was around. So um, this was obviously not going to be the best solution. So this was then followed. The team back at Millbank, back at the Royal Army Medical College, working very hard to develop new masks, came up with flannel hoods. And here we can see some of the cotton waste masks. And by contrast, here are the hoods. Well, you can see that this is actually developing quite nicely. And the hoods were soaked not in water, not in urine, but in um, a mixture of sodium hypochlorite and glycerin. Uh, the glycerin being sort of rather sticky, sort of kept them damp. Um, the sodium hypochlorite inactivated the chlorine so that inside these masks, you were actually able to breathe fairly well and they were reasonably effective. Well, of course, um, the nature of warfare is that you leapfrog forward. Um, you, first of all, start throwing rocks at people and um, people protect their buildings, their living accommodation um, with wooden fences, and then um, they have to strengthen that, and eventually explosives are invented, and you've got to um, develop stone walls to protect your buildings. And so you leapfrog forward between uh, attack and defense. And as we learned to combat um, the worst effects of chlorine as a gas, so the Germans started to develop new gases such as phosgene. Um, and so we were developing new gas masks. Now, um, I, I say we and the Germans, but in fact, this, was, this became two-sided. And much as we um, hate the idea of chemical weapons today, um, and there are all sorts of international treaties in place to avoid it, not that it stops them being used in some countries, um, but in fact, the British did also use gas um, to a certain extent during the First World War as well. Although, as I said, with um, the vagaries of the weather and um, changing uh, wind direction, it did prove to be a bit of a, uh, a double-edged weapon. Later on the, uh, in the First World War, the small box respirator was developed, and this um, actually had a, a charcoal filter, and this proved to be um, a huge improvement, and it remained in use until the Second World War. Um, and even to this day, charcoal filters um, are the basis of um, military anti-gas respirators. So what was the impact of poison gas? Well, um, it only accounted for about 1% of all British fatalities, about 7,500 people. But 180,000 were badly wounded, and many of those went on to develop eye problems and respiratory problems in later life. It was also not without risk to medical staff because, of course, uniforms would absorb the gas and as people came into the hospitals, um, their uniforms would be off-gassing. Um, so medical staff themselves would be exposed. Later on, of course, protocols were developed for stripping the uniforms off, showering people down, very much in the same way that we deal with um, chemical weapons today. Um, there was a risk to the workers impregnating the helmets with potentially toxic chemicals. And then there was that psychological effect of seeing that cloud coming towards you. And uh, as this particular soldier says here, 
you know, in many ways, it was more frightening than the bombs. I was terrified of gas, to tell you the truth. I was more frightened with the gas than I was with shell fire. And inevitably, there was this gas neurosis that developed, um, which was very similar to shell shock, this sort of fear of something arriving, which you could do nothing about unless you got your helmet on in time. So we're coming towards the end now. The war is drawing to a close, but our unseen enemy of the microbe still has one more card to play. 1819, 1818, the H1N1 influenza virus reared its head. It may well have started in a troop staging post in France. You remember um, that I, I said that as people come together, people with infection will act as a focus for spreading it to very large numbers of people who have no immunity. And it, it may be that as troops were beginning to draw down, uh, as the war was clearly drawing to a close, that may be where it started. It's commonly known as Spanish flu, but there's not very much evidence that it actually started in Spain. But it was a particularly horrific strain of flu because it particularly affected um, young people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, and so it was attacking the very generation who'd just been fighting a prolonged war. Um, and it had a very high mortality. People developed very severe respiratory disease, severe pneumonia, and they would die very abruptly. There were stories of people actually falling down dead in the street um, with um, this particular strain of flu. And the deaths from the conflict, in fact, on a global scale, paled into insignificance in comparison with Spanish flu because it's estimated that probably 10 million military, 7 million civilians died in the conflict. Somewhere between 50 to 100 million people died in the flu epidemic, the flu pandemic. And that brings us back to Sir William Osler. In war, the microbe kills more than the bullet. Well, certainly at the end of the war it did. Let's have a look at Osler again. He was born in Canada and he was appointed Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford in 1905. He was a major contributor to modern medical training. He more or less invented the teaching ward round in the format that certainly when I was a medical student we, we knew and loved. He had one surviving son, one had died in infancy, and his son was very keen to join the army and go and contribute to the war effort, but he was turned down on medical grounds because he had very poor eyesight. And he was so keen to join the army that his father pulled some strings to get him accepted as an officer, and he was killed at Passchendaele. Osler himself, in 1919, died in the influenza pandemic. On that sadly downbeat look, we have to end this look at the first 65 years of military public health. But it's not all bad news. It's not all negative. It's a story of huge achievement, from the beginnings of the scientific discipline of hygiene to the key recognition that we hold to this day that for public health to be effective, it needs everyone to be involved, from government right down to each individual. It's also a story of the pioneering days of immunization, people putting in long hours, exposing themselves to risk, and thinking, as we'd say today, outside the box, developing new solutions to new challenges. And perhaps that's the real challenge of public health, in peacetime as much as in war. Just when we think we're beginning to gain the upper hand, something new comes along to challenge us. Perhaps in modern times we think of HIV, Ebola, or the obesity crisis. It's people like Parks, Leishman, and Horrocks who demonstrated the need for a flexible, open-minded approach to problems. And that approach is as valid today as when they were at the peak of their careers. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes.
This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk slash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.